All right. For this segment, we're going to focus on refining the schedule, making the minor tweaks and changes that bring the schedule into an achievable balance, or relatively so, as you'll, you'll come to see. There's a few things I'll show you up front before we start making changes, and they're things that you may have noticed along the way, but we'll find out what they actually do at this point. So what you see in front of you is what we effectively left off with at the end of the last segment, except I managed to evenly distribute zones 2 and 3 throughout the rest of the year. Now intuitively, you may imagine that it should be a little more uniform than this, but remember as I said before, we'll have unintended consequences throughout the year because of the nature of our calendar structure. Four weeks is not a month. And so, for example, where we saw those two zones, zones two and three, stack at the end of February, in the beginning of March, we now see that there has been a spike of hours that have aggregated there. So those are the kinds of things that we're going to get into and start moving around. But if I can direct your attention to the left, there's a large section of these utilities and tools that are actually intended to help us say, what can we do? At this point, we see the hours throughout the year, but that doesn't say anything about what's actually achievable. So there are two modes to the available hours section. The first mode is a rough estimate average available hours. For this demonstration, I'm going to say that our HVAC shop has 300 hours available. And when I enter that in and recalculate, you're going to see something change on the graph. On the right, when I showed you the legend before, I showed you the dotted line gives us available hours. And here's where that line comes in. You can see across the spectrum that we've breached our available hours. So this schedule would not be achievable. What you can also see is that there are dips. And these dips are representative of holidays. So I'm going to step aside from this graph for a second to describe how you adjust the holiday cycle. At the bottom, there is a holidays tab. We've gone out to opm.gov and acquired the list of official holidays moving out till 2020. As we go along, we've added dates that were not originally planned for. For example, the president gave us an extra day at Christmas during the year of 2014. Each of these dates has a description, but more importantly, we have a nice formula that has identified the Monday, the date of the Monday for the week that that holiday falls on, so that we can adjust the number of available hours in an automated way. That's where the WRF comes in, as we've referred to it as the weekly reduction factor. Now, all of this is terribly in the weeds, and you might find that it's not even particularly necessary. So there's a nice help box, a tool tip, if you will, that can give you a little more instruction on how to use this. For now, I'll just leave it as it is and say that we've set up some basic assumptions on reduced hours for the weeks of holidays. Moving back to the analysis tools, when I place in my 300 average available hours, you can see that the dates are dipping based on the holidays that occur during those weeks. For example, you can see that the month of November shows us Thanksgiving, and there is a great number of hours reduced or lost because of the nature of that holiday. Also, during the Christmas season and New Year's, 
we effectively assume that there will be no work done. All right. One other thing that you might have noticed about this chart is that there's a row of red text along the top. This represents the number of hours over the available man hours. So for example, with the 12th of January and the 19th, you can see we're well under our available man hours curve and there are no red numbers. Counter to that is the 2nd of March as we indicated before and we know for sure that there are 320 hours more during that week than we can realistically accomplish. Now all of this automated information can be helpful for a quick determination but it's hardly sufficient for doing the job well. Instead it would be much advised to use the second mode of the available hours in which you assign hours to each week and those hours become translated to the graph. This clearly represents a more realistic curve and there are some additional things that should be considered when doing this. So for example, in Alaska, the month of July and realistically the majority of the summer is typically dedicated on many people's calendar to fishing. So instead of assuming that we'll have everybody present, we've made the reduction because historically we know we'll have fewer hours available. I think you're probably beginning to see the point here, but there's one more thing I'd like to talk about regarding the available hours. This is where you can utilize knowledge about prior work history to keep a nice balance throughout your year. You can say, for example, that during the early summer months, we need to make sure that our air conditioning is in tip-top shape so we can expect we will have less hours for PM. The northern climates, it's your winter months that prove to be particularly resource intensive for obvious reasons. Now moving on from this description, we're going to get into the actual tweaking of this information. The first thing that I'm focused on is that early March peak that we have. And when I see it, I see a couple of things that are nice. Number one, moving down to the zones, I can see that during that peak, we have all three zones. But most importantly, we have zone one that can be matched up with the week prior and a little bit of zone three that can be matched up with the week after. What's more, I know that I have 320 hours over and if I take zone one at 195 hours and zone three at 67 hours, I know I won't get under the curve, but I will bring it in line with the rest of my year. Again, we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for the 80 to 90% solution. And one very important thing to consider is we're going to have to do a mitigation strategy regardless. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the zone one assets whose PM frequencies fall on the 2nd of March. But there's an important note here. Before, when we set the date, we were assigning the annual PM date. Now, we are not just concerned with assets whose annual PM occurs on the 2nd of March but also whose other frequency PM cycles occur on this date as well. In order to identify those, we've added a feature on the left side where we can flag a date and it will highlight all of the facilities whose PM falls on that date regardless of PM type. So what I'm going to do is type in the 2nd of March 2015 
I'll move back to the PMTL Assignments tab and I'll recalculate. I've already introduced the Zones Calculated column to you and the Sums Calculated column to you. But this last column is the Flagged column. And if I filter only for those items that have been flagged, I will quickly see that I've captured annual PM assets that fall on the 2nd of March, as well as assets whose annual PM falls on other dates. This flag option allows you to make quick adjustments. It's also important to note that if you look at the zone column, we've captured other zones than just one. And at this stage, I only want to move zone one back one week. So while I already have the flagged column filtered, I need to make certain that my zone column is filtered as well. Now that I've done that, I can see that all of my assets either fall on the 2nd of March, have some form of a frequency that falls on the 2nd of March, and are only in zone 1. Now in this case, I want to move all of my zone assets back into the previous week, so I'm going to use what we have as the Adjustment Assist cell. Now when you first see this, you'll notice that it says Adjustment Assist 7 days. Now even though this looks like it's a string of text, if you view the formula bar, you'll see that to Excel it is only a number. That means if I copy this cell and paste it as a value in some other location, it only sees it as a number. Now I'm going to undo that. But what I'd like to do is try to move Zone 1 assets a small bit at a time in order to make the adjustment gradual. In this case, I'm going to use two days because that seems like a generally reasonable amount to start with. If you start with a full week, you will definitely get those assets into the previous week, but you may also have larger consequences throughout the rest of the year. So in order to do this, I'm going to copy my Adjustment Assist cell that I've set to two days. I'm going to select all of the assets that I want to adjust, and I'm going to subtract two days from their assigned date by using the minus button. When I do this, I can be assured that all of my dates match. So when I shift back to the Analysis Tools, I'm going to keep an eye on Zone 1, and I'm going to click on Recalculate. And as it turns out, perhaps through the magic of demonstration, I have shifted all of my assets from Zone 1 off of the 2nd of March to the 23rd of February. Now we'll do the same thing for Zone 3. I already have the 2nd of March flagged, but I need to change my Zone filter to capture my Zone 3 assets. I'll then copy my Adjustment Assist and select my Tables column. But in this case, I don't want to subtract two days. I want to add them. When I go back to the Analysis Tools tab, and recalculate. We're keeping an eye on the Zone 3 assets. We were able to move them all to the 9th of March. So relatively speaking, what we see here is that throughout the year, we have a fairly regular level of PM. Now you may say, but Scott, we have empty weeks, and we have weeks that breach our available man hours. And honestly, I would have to agree. But we also have not put very much work into this. 
In fact, everything that I've done so far would take me about 15 minutes to load in my PM1 data, get my initial distribution on the first three weeks, distribute out through the entire year for all three of my zones, and make one week's adjustment. My expectation from this point on would be to make many more adjustments. So instead of making a few now, I think you can see that you adjust your dates by increments. But what I'd like to communicate to you is a few things to look for. Philosophically speaking, we want to maintain our zone integrity as much as we've been able to maintain our facility integrity. What that means is that we want as few zones to straddle a week as possible. We've already cleared up one week and made sure that there was only one zone in that week. But I like to scan the data to see if there's anywhere where I have three zones again. The reason why this matters is that you can imagine yourself starting out the week driving to one zone and then at some time in that week shifting to another region of the base. But you really don't want to have to shift from one region to the next and then next week you're going back to the previous region and then to a completely different one. That can make your shifts a little bit wonky in how you're driving and you can't necessarily get multiple people out to different facilities using limited vehicles. What I see here is that I have a transition from zone 1 during the week of the 30th of March into zone 2. And the next week I maintain my route in zone 2 only shifting to zone 3 likely near the end of the week. Now, wrapping up this segment, we learned a few things about refining the data as we see it in the viewport program. We learned about the available hours and modifying it on a weekly basis. We learned about flagging assets whose PM frequencies fall on a particular date regardless of frequency type. We learned about how to modify a group of assets by moving them back or forward a number of days. And finally, this segment was primarily focused on recognizing what the term balanced really means. At this moment, I'd like to take a few minutes to answer any questions or reflect on considerations that have come up.